And we come to you today and we ask that you would have your way with this word, Father. I found it encouraging to me. I hope it will be encouraging to your congregation and your body. I want to thank you for it, Lord. For your word is precious. It does good things in our hearts. It changes lives. It encourages and builds up. And Father, so today we thank you again for the sunshine. We thank you again for the sunshine. <laughs> Father, watch over this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, beloved of the Lord. And they all said, who's that? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, amen. Who? The good, yeah, the beloved of the Lord. That'll be a good one. Good preaching. Take an offering. Anyway, we'll start today. You're coming down the road at an intersection, the green light changes to yellow. At a theater, the house lights kind of dim or start to flash. At a railroad crossing, the lights begin to flash. And a car in front of you out on the freeway all of a sudden turns on his signal and starts to flash. At least we hope he does. And a voice in the wilderness of Judea is heard declaring, prepare ye the way of the Lord. At times we get desensitized to things, don't we? Those warnings don't always come to fruition. They don't seem to be the end-all, be-all. We take things for granted. In fact, we can even become desensitized to Jesus' warnings as well as warnings of others. Listen to some of the warning products that had to be put on because people didn't use common sense. On a baby stroller, it's been noted that you have to remove the child before folding up. <laughs> On an iron, never iron clothes while they are being worn. An electric router, this product is not intended as a dentist drill. An electric saw, do not attempt to stop the chain with your hands. And the favorite of all so far has been toilet bowl brush, do not use orally. But sometimes for people that do those things, you just can't fix stupid, can you? Amen. But I would ask us today, what warnings do we ignore? Which ones do we shrug off? Which ones apply to everyone else but me? Now, what do all these warnings have in common? Well... All of the warnings are things that we need to be prepared for. Matthew 25 and 13 is the book we'll be in today. Matthew chapter 25. But 25 and 13 says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Matthew 25 is sharing a word that Mark 13 shared. It's a Greek word called Gregorio or Gregorio. And it's translated for us to keep awake and even maybe more accurately be prepared. How many of you guys were Boy Scouts? The motto was be prepared. Amen? Three fingers. And, and down like that. Cub Scouts were two. Three, and then we, you know. Anyway. Being prepared, there was a story told about General Douglas MacArthur, and you know that he graduated from West Point at the top of his class, but he continued in his life to prepare himself for the service of his country. Now, you would think a guy that made top of his class was pretty well ready, but he didn't stop there. He continues on. He studied every military textbook that he could get his hands on. He visited battlefields and personally reviewed tactics, which both the victors and the losers used. While other officers were out playing cards or practicing their golf swing, MacArthur ignored the social world to make himself better prepared as a future leader. MacArthur even insisted on having his appendix removed in case that it would ever cause him to be incapacitated at a point in time that his service was vital to our country. But we know that his preparedness proved to be wise, didn't it? 
As a key military leader in the Pacific theater and operations during World War II, he had personally responded to his country's call, but he had done it actually years before the war ever started by preparing himself to be a top general. One could only wonder how history might have turned out differently if General MacArthur had not been prepared. He lived in the very present, which we do also, but his eye was on the future. His preparation was for down the road. His preparation was for what may come next. But he took his time and he learned from the past struggles of others. History is important, is it not? Each Christian can have that kind of commitment. And we sang about surrendering all. Brother Mark talked about when you surrender all, it's, it's all. And it goes on to take time. But are we preparing ourselves for service to Christ or have we kind of stopped? I understand that I continue to read books. I understand that I talk to different people. But we're needing to continue, as MacArthur's example, continue to prepare. Now, we're in chapter 25, or will be, 24, 25 in there. And Jesus' last sermons to his disciples before he was betrayed, and that avenue stretches between Matthew 23 and 25, and a large portion of that section is about his second coming. This is the main theme of that long message. And it's understandable since he is about ready to leave them. He probably wants to instill them and give them the most information he can while he's in front of them. Jesus needs, not, Jesus needs to tell them about his return and what they're supposed to do. He describes the day with a certainty. He leaves no room for doubt. He did not say that he may return, but that he will return. He did not tell us when the day will be. Nobody knows except for God the Father. But he describes to us what that day very well may look like or will look like. And I think that's an important thing for us to look at today, too. Not that when he will return, but what are the circumstances prior? We need to listen to what he says, because are we not in that situation today? He tells us in Matthew 24 and 37, it's going to be like the days of Noah. Well, what were those days like? It was business as usual. People were going through their daily routine. They're skeptical of what was going to come. And many are even failing to believe God's word. And many are unprepared for Christ's return. This is what it says in Matthew 24, 37. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, up to the very day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing. What a sad statement. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. It wasn't as if they hadn't been warned. Noah preached to them for a hundred years. He built an ark in his backyard where rain had never come. Hadn't happened. But it must have been a reminder that Noah believed in his heart what the Lord had told him and making it a reminder for them that he is preparing for doing what God had told him to do. So it becomes a witness, if you will. They were eating and drinking everyday life. But they weren't listening to the warning. They were doing their own thing. The word says that they did not know they were caught by surprise. They did not know anything not because they didn't hear but because they didn't listen they tuned Noah out and because of that they were surprised that what he said would happen actually happened as he said it would happen therefore 
keep watch because you do not know on what day or hour your Lord will, con will come. If this condition is a part of our time, our time just prior to his return, and I'm not saying that he is returning tomorrow, but he could come before I quit today. That's how close I believe it is. We need to take note of those conditions. We don't want to be caught unprepared, do we? There are two commands within the scriptures of 24, the end, early 25, the middle of 25, and they're telling us in verse 42 of 24, keep watch. In verse 44, it says, be ready. Jesus wants us to remain focused on the fact that he is returning, and it could be soon. I don't know the day. I don't know the hour. My Father in heaven does. But I believe in my heart that there will be a day when the last Gentile comes in that he's going to lean over to his son and say, go get our family. Bring them home. We need to take note of that. But we have to also remember, Mark said it this morning, it's not about the time of his return. I don't need to know that day, that hour. It's about the condition of our heart. If my heart is ready, it could be 100 years from now. None of you will see it, but if it's ready, it could be 15 minutes from now. If it's ready, it could be another 10 years. Are we ready? Is that where we're at? Are we doing what he expects from us to do? Pastor Bruce has talked about that. We need to be about our father's business. We need to do that which he has called us to do, to put us into places to do. If we notice as we look at chapter 24, 25, Jesus, to the importance of the whole thing, put three parables, parables together in a row to emphasize that need. In 24, 44 to 51, he tells, talks about the faithful and wise servants waiting for the return of their master. In 25, 1 through 13, the ten virgins with the lamps were waiting for the bridegroom. 25, 14 to 18, the servants that were entrusted with a different number of talents were waiting for their master's return. But in the process, they were not wasting the talents. They were trying to make them multiply. They were trying to do good with what they've been given. Some are only given one talent. Use it. Don't be like the one that buried it. Some are given five. 24 and 46, Jesus said it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. What will it be then on the flip side if as he returns finds this servant sitting on his cheeks? Well, I was going to say but, but that would have embarrassed everybody. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> he should be doing what the master entrusted him to do. Amen? Amen? I heard a preacher recently encouraging the body of Christ. He said, trust the Holy Spirit and go out at the Father's bidding and answer the Eliezer call. Eliezer was a servant that Abraham sent out to get a bride for his son. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. We have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Go answer the call. Go out at the Father's sending and get the bride ready for the Son. It's not going to be comfortable always, but look at what has been going on in the last few days. God has prepared a world of anger to hear about his son. I'm the God of life. I'm the one that creates it. There will be discussions that we'll be able to have, I believe, at the bidding of the Holy Spirit. Divine appointments if you will I think it'll be good I talked to a man the other day 
It was really a good conversation until I reminded him. I said, you told me you were coming to church. Oh, 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 yes, sir. Yeah. Well, you're still welcome anytime. But he got real antsy. Well, let's notice a couple things from the parable of the ten virgins. Turn on into Matthew 25, and we'll look through 1 through 13. The main thrust is Jesus is coming back. Be prepared. And here's what the word says. At that time, the kingdom, verse 1, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in their jars, or took oil in jars along with their lamps. What did the wise ones do? They made preparations in case there was a delay in the time of coming. There are many today warning of different things. There could be food shortages. There are actual websites started up for survivalist items. Uh, there is Patriot Food with a guarantee of 25 years freshness. I don't know. I do know that the Flint Board of Education bought civil defense food many years ago. And then they foolishly put it into the basements of the buildings, which leaked. And then I lovingly was paid hourly for days on end to help remove all the rotten cardboard, stinky, nasty stuff that probably died 30 years before. But they're still guaranteeing it today. What happened with the wise people? I believe that they had a close relationship with Jesus. They weren't going to be taken unawares. They weren't going to just have it happen. The, five, the bridegroom, we see here in verse number 5, was a long time in coming, wasn't he? And they became drowsy, and they fell asleep. A warning to us today is that in the time of delay before Jesus is coming, there is a tendency for people to get sleepy in their faith. Remember Noah? They were unprepared. They were caught by surprise. I have seen in the last month or two different people that I knew, well, I didn't know them, but had given testimony, have walked into many things of the world. Shakespeare said, delay can be a dangerous thing. David Wilkerson, the great Assembly of God preacher and I believe prophet Christians will go to sleep when they stop looking expectantly for Jesus' soon return how about that do you think it's true when I have something that I'm looking forward to and it doesn't happen over and over and doesn't happen over and over I think we can get to a point like he said Christians will go to sleep I do believe some are waking up. I think there's a rejoicing in this country today. But I still think there needs to be an expectancy. But even with that delay, there should be an expectancy, shouldn't there? We had a couple in this church last Christmas that had delayed because of family problems stuck all over the country. But the expectancy for that family greeting and celebration at Christmas was there. We can't wait. We're just getting... Everything put into it, we've delayed it, but we're going to have a great time. And it was good. I've run into people in the last week that rarely miss work. But as I said, they become antsy when you invite them to church. They're preparing their houses. They're preparing for trips. They're preparing for many things, but they're not aware of the preparation for their salvation, which is going to take a lot more wonder and joy than the 4th of July boating weekend. And don't get me wrong, I like 4th of July. But there's a need for preparing. Now, this preparation is going on. 
People are, it's not anything new under the sun, is it? But we need to be aware to, I believe, help the world. Because look what the Apostle Peter reminds us of in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 10. Knowing this first, scoffers are going to come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget. I like that idea. They didn't just forget. They willfully forgot. They put it out of their mind. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. By which that world, or by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by that same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. He says, but beloved, who's he speaking to? The church. Beloved, the saved, the born-again Christian. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's going to catch people unaware. People are going to be there, and they're just not going to understand it. There's some of them are going to be people that have been sitting in churches. We prayed for two or three of them today, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, leaders that are sitting in churches that are telling them everything's fine. So that they go out and say, tell everybody, everything's fine. And then one day they're going to wake up and say, oh, shoot, we had no relationship. We had no oil. There's a problem, and it's too late. But the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away in a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat, but the, both the earth and the works that are in it will burn up. Our parables here are emphasizing that need for watchfulness in the event of a long delay in Christ's coming. Every generation has witnessed changes that lead them to believe that Jesus could return at any moment. Hippolytus, an early church father, was convinced Christ was going to be back by 500 A.D. Martin Luther in the 1500s said, We have reached the time of the white, throne, white horse of apocalypse. The world will not last longer than 100 years. Christopher Columbus, bless you, said, There is no doubt the world must end in 155 years. William Miller, who started Millerism, a Baptist preacher in the 1800s, said that Jesus would return between 1842 and 1843, and he based it off the Jewish calendar. Isn't it amazing how many have tried to predict Christ's return? Scripture says that no man knows that day or that hour. Not even Jesus himself could tell us. But people keep predicting times of a return, don't they? I wondered why. And then I was reading and said, someone said, because it's easier to guess the time of his return than it is to live a life that is ready for that return. I watched a man the other day in a movie. He had won the, the uh, Medal of Honor, Congressional Medal of Honor. Toward the end of the movie, He'd done some hard things, and his best friend asked him why he had gotten into this. He said, you won the Medal of Honor. You, you, you saved my life. He said it was a lot easier to win that medal than it was to live it. And I'm not picking on anybody because I fall under the same shoe leather. It's hard to live a Christian life at times. But at verse number six, it said there was a midnight cry that rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. One of the attendants was there. Woven into our scriptures this morning was the custom of the Eastern wedding, wasn't it? The bridegroom is 
at his father's house. Kind of a picture of where Christ is with the father. And from there, he would go to the bride's house. And usually after dark, because they had torches, and, but they never knew when he would show. And boys being boys, we would try to show up when they were least expected or not prepared. You know, we're going to catch them by surprise. Well, they were all sleeping, weren't they? But yet one of them were out there. But then he would take this woman home to the house he had prepared for them. Oh, hello, John 14. I go away, make a place for you. And he would take them back to that place where their life would become new. And they would be together for the rest of their lives, hopefully. But they were waiting. There doesn't seem to be much difference in our virgins, does there? They were all virgins, they all took lamps, they all slept while they waited, and they all went forth to meet the bridegroom. Yet there was one vital and essential difference between them. And that difference, I read, makes all the difference. They had oil of a relationship. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. Oil in their lamps and extra with them in case they were spending time probably hammering on the door of heaven. Lord, I need to hear you today. Lord, I want to be hot. I want to be like this last verse of uh, uh, surrender all. Lord, make all of me thine. They had that. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Five had prepared and five really had never done that. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said, give us some of your oil. Mario Murillo lately, as of late, has been saying and warning, press in, be prepared with the amount of faith that we have gotten through and walked in for many years may not be enough to get you through the coming days. Press in. Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. I don't want anybody's lamps to go out. Another one of our warnings comes. Some things you just can't borrow. While spiritual preparation is a must, spiritual preparation is also individual. No one can do it for you. No one can wear the parachute in your plane. It doesn't work that way. We need our own. The foolish saw that they didn't have enough oil, and they asked their wise friends to loan them some. But it wasn't possible. Another person's faith is not going to cover you. I could sit over sit next to Sister Susan or Sister Mary Ann or Sister Pat or Brother Tom, you know, Brother Joe, and I could sit there. What are you doing? Waiting for that faith to jump off onto me. I want it all over me. Let it go. But it doesn't work that way. I can't catch faith the way I do a cold, do I? I can rub shoulders all day long. The only thing I'll probably get is slapped by Sister Susan or get a sore shoulder out of it. Remember, God has no grandchildren, but just children. And every spiritual birth comes directly from him. And our faith must be our own. Now, while it is good to sing the song, Faith of Our Fathers, it is even better, I think, to be able to say, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Don't try to borrow somebody else's oil. Just make sure you have some of your own. Character cannot be borrowed, and neither can a relationship with God. Oh, I enjoyed going to church when I was a teenager. My goodness, I felt so good, Pastor Bruce. I always felt better coming out. After I hung up the robes and everything else, but then I realized it wasn't a relationship. I was going to a building, and I like dressing up. I still do. But now I have a, a relationship. Barclay, William Barclay said, we cannot always live, be living on the spiritual capital that others have amassed. There are certain things that we must acquire for ourselves. Verse 8 says, they were unable to meet the bridegroom. Our lamps have gone out. What a sad testimony. What a sad thing. And the virgins that were waiting 
for the bridegroom ought to have prepared enough. That was their job, wasn't it? It wasn't God's job to continue to pour it in. He will. But often we're nearsighted people. We only see today the problems, the pressures, the deadlines. I've got to meet this. And we forget to look down the road in the preparation of next time. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us on you. Go to those that would sell it. Go find God. Get some for yourself. Certain things cannot be obtained at the last minute. Isn't that right? How many times have we gone out, oh, shoot, I forgot to buy the milk today and go to the store to find out everybody else has been there. There's many things, but procrastination is a practice of carrying out less urgent tasks and preference for more urgent ones or doing more pleasurable things in place of the less pleasurable ones, thus putting off impending tasks. But procrastination is not an action of the wise, is it? They choose not to be waiting to the last minute for things that involve the relationship with God. But while they were on their way, verse 10 says, to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him in the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. See, there's a day coming, brothers and sisters, that that door is going to shut, not to open again. I read a thing on one of the churches here recently that God's mercy does not extend into death and the beyond. It's here now. Later, those others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us that everything has a time under heaven. There's one that's not listed there, and I believe Matthew Henry put it in his writings, or I think it was Henry. He said it was a, a time called too late. It's too late. Most don't want to be reminded that that's part of life. But here's what the bridegroom, who was Jesus, replied. Truly, I tell you, I don't know you. What a horrible statement to stand there. I've heard of Jesus, Pastor Bruce, of his love and how he needs me and how he cares for me. Depart from me. I never knew you. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But Jesus says, therefore, keep your watch because you don't know the day or the hour the Lord will come back. We need to be prepared. And I'll close with this. During one of his expeditions to the Antarctic, Sir Ernest Shackleton left some of his men on Elephant Island with the intent of returning for them and taking them back to England. But he was delayed three times as he tried to reach them, but each time he had been prevented by ice flows that stopped him and delayed him. Finally, on his fourth try, he broke through and found a narrow channel to that island. As he approached, much to his surprise, he found the crewmen sitting there waiting for him. The supplies were packed, and they were ready to be put on board. And they were on their way back to England. He asked them, he said, how do you, did you know, how did they know to be ready for him? They told him they didn't know when he would return, but they were sure that he would. That was one of their needs. They knew he was coming back for them, if there was any way possible. So every morning, the leader rolled up his sleeping bags and goods. He packed all of his gear, and he told the crew, you do the same thing. Get your things ready, boys. The boss may come today. I thought you'd like that one because you call him the boss. Amen. Jesus could be coming soon. Are we ready? We're all on that same playing field today. The door of grace stands open. And I don't believe 
that a lot of this was for this congregation other than we need to tell the world and we need to be assured that he's coming back because then when we speak out of the authority of his word where he says no man knows that day or that hour that the Lord shall return we have authority to convince people to stand with me if you need prayer this morning we'd be happy to pray with you if not father we thank you for this time this day help us father to truly be ready make our hearts right make it to where we need anything you need to come and look into father you do that because we know as brother mark said this morning the best deal we could ever find is eternity with you and we'll thank you for that